Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Zandi, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by only one of my colleagues this week, Chris Dorides. Chris, how are you? Doing well, thanks. How are you doing, Mark? Where's Ryan? Ryan is at the Jersey Shore with his family. No, no, I, 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 didn't, I thought he was going to Boston to see the Red Sox. Uh, he's at the New Jersey Shore. That was, uh, that was last week or the week before? Was... Well, he's, oh, he's like on perpetual vacation, that guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's anyway, doing his part to support the uh, the economy here. So yeah, do you know which part of the New Jersey beach he's at? I don't know which which beach specifically, but yeah, it's got a family, so I'm thinking it's a family friendly, family friendly one. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, I, I always go to the uh, July Fourth that week or the week after. Uh, my all my siblings and all their kids. I've got four siblings, and they each have three. We each have three kids. We all go down to the Stone Harbor and Avalon every year and hang out there for, for a week. And, uh, you know, you have your normal family fight after day one, day two, then everything kind of calms down in the week. Very nice week uh, at the New Jersey beach. So nice place to go. Won the uh, Sandcastle competition this year. Oh, that's the other thing. We, yeah, there is a contest. Uh, we didn't play this year. I don't know why something came up, a uh, timing oh. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're, 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 but we have no talent. We're, we're brute force, you know, meaning <laughs> we move a lot of sand to try to the shock and awe, you know, strategy. <laughs> we are, the only one, the only one with any talent is my wife, Ava, but she like, you know, builds something beautiful, but it's like so small, no one can see it. It's like, you know, why are you doing that? <laughs> you know, so anyway, we've won in the past, but uh, thanks for asking that. That was kind of you to ask. Yeah. I know it's nothing like your Italian Riviera, you know, kind of. Uh, you have a very uh, interesting perspective. I, don't know. Okay. <laughs> I have to, I have to pull back the uh, curtain sometime and show you the oh, reality. Yeah, yeah. I like, I like to see the village you guys are from. You know, at some point. Uh, uh, nothing yeah. special. So. <laughs> oh, anyway, so uh, we do, we do have a guest. I'm not going to. She is uh, sitting in the wings. A bit of a mystery. Uh, we're going to bring her in. We're going to talk a lot about the Inflation Reduction Act and the climate provisions in the IRA. And she's uh, an expert on uh, uh, climate related issues. So looking forward to that, but we'll keep that over here on the side for just a minute. Cause I do want you, Chris, to, cause we're sitting here, this is Wednesday, August 17th, midday, and a little earlier than we normally do the podcast, but we've gotten a number of economic releases uh, this week. And yes. I thought retail sales, housing, uh, I thought I'd just kind of turn to you and give it, give uh, everyone a sense of uh, those releases and what they're saying about the economy. Yeah, uh, sure. So um, I'll start with retail sales, which came out this morning. Um, I think the uh, I think the data continues uh, this trend of mixed signals, right? Every data point uh, seems to have uh, tell a different story when we're thinking about recession risks and the, the overall uh, economy. So uh, retail sales for the month were flat, right? From, uh, from June to, to July, which at, at, at the headline level might might be a bit concerning, but then you dig a little bit deeper and uh, a lot of that flatness, if you will, was due to um, gasoline and uh, auto sales, which were down. And so it, the control retail sales, right, which exclude what gas, autos, restaurants, and building materials were actually up 0.8% from June to July. So it does suggest that underneath it all, consumers still are willing to, to spend um, still out there uh, contributing to the economy, but perhaps some of their trends or some of their uh, preferences for spending are, are shifting. So I mentioned gas, uh, um, sales of gas stations were down, but that's largely due to the drop in gas prices. So hard to complain about, uh, about that as a, as a decline. There was a decline in motor vehicle and parts sales, right? So that perhaps is a bit more interesting in terms of all the pent-up demand that we think is out there for, uh, for cars, uh, still not being satisfied, or perhaps consumers starting to pull back. So there's a little bit of a mystery there in terms of how consumers are responding. You had an increase in building materials sales and uh, an increase in non-store sales, so internet uh, sales. So on Amazon or Amazon Prime Day might have uh, driven that. So a lot of uh, moving parts here. Overall, though, I would still suggest that this is supportive of the idea that consumers are uh, still confident enough in the economy to continue spending, but their patterns of spending may be, may be shifting around. So, so uh, the way I would put it is uh, the firewall continues to hold. That is the American consumer is the firewall between 
the continued uh, growing economy in recession. And if you look at this report, you say that firewall is holding tough, right? Bottom line. Yeah, holding. I would say it's not uh, accelerating. Yeah. It's not that consumers yeah. are out there really um, doing more than abandoned. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Which, and this way, motor vehicles is an interesting aspect. I, and again, it's one month of data. We always want to be cautious in terms of reading too much into a single data point. But the fact that it actually fell is interesting. It, it may it may point to some weakness, perhaps, in terms of uh, durable goods or consumers. I doubt it. I doubt it. With, with, the, with the mystery guest out there, we might press her on this because yeah. he's got standing here, but it feels like sales are awfully low and it's supply. I can't get a car because there's nothing in inventory. And as we get more production, more inventory, we'll see more car sales. But uh, but if there's anywhere where there's pent up demand, you know, where people put off spend, spending because they just couldn't buy, it would be on the vehicle side. So I, I'm not too worried about yeah, that. Yeah, you would think, but yeah. yeah. Well, one quick question, one quick question. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if we've talked about this on the podcast, but the thing that's been curious to me is that the consumers have all this so-called excess saving, you know, extra saving they did during the pandemic because they were sheltering in place and not spending or lower middle income households because they got a lot of government support. And it feels like they're, you know, it's by our calculation, it's still close to two and a half trillion in excess saving, which is well over 10% of GDP. That's a lot of cash. And it's all sitting in people's checking accounts. And we know that because banks are reporting their checking deposit accounts are overflowing. And so we know that's where the cash is. So it's easy to get to, but people just aren't, you know, they're, they're supplementing the hit to their income from the higher inflation, the higher gas prices, food prices, and everything, but they're not, it doesn't feel like they're spending beyond that. Right. And they're just going right up to that and saying, Hey, I'm going to spend, but I'm not going to spend with abandon, which I find a bit surprising. I, I would have thought we'd see it's fine. It allows the economy to move forward, but I thought we might see some, you know, happy days are here again. We, we never really saw that. Well, I think it points to the confidence. Consumers are still very reticent mm -hmm. in terms of yeah. the uh, prospects of the future. So I think there's a lot of precautionary saving that's going on. Yeah, I, have, I might have that ability that that nest egg is there, but I might need it. I don't know if I'm really ready to spend with abandon. And that's why I thought maybe some of this Perhaps some of this uh, delay in terms of spending on a new car may actually be real. People hmm. you know, being a little cautious, maybe they could afford it. Uh, certainly, the higher end consumer. So you're still cautious. sticking to that, no matter what I say. You're still sticking. Well, to that. Uh, yeah. okay, fair enough. Yeah, uh, got it. Got to mix hey, it up here. <laughs> I do want to. We're going to end the conversation soon, so we can yeah. move on. But on housing, we got some pretty tough numbers there, didn't yes. we? On the housing there. is clearly slowing. Right, starts were down uh, uh, across the board. Uh, permits were down on the single family side, actually up a little bit on the multifamily uh, side. But overall, uh, clearly the housing picture is, is darkening uh, relative to where it was. There's a lot of talk about re housing recession. I don't, I, I don't know if I'm prepared to go that far. So clearly really? there is, I mean, there, it's there definitely slowing. recession. It, it's going backwards, right? I mean, it is going sales backwards. Sales are down, it's construction, the starts are down. The next two to fall is prices. I can't, feels like they're going to fall here. Too, so. definitely slow, yeah. But but still, we're at 2019 level, right? We're not. The, well, the recession floor hasn't uh, okay. fallen okay. out. All right. It depends okay. how. So sure, recession. I would say mild recession so far. Okay. Is it a not a crash? Hair on fire recession? I I don't think so. And I think there's still lots of demand out there. So I'm not quite at the point I to see. declare that you know housing is never going to recover here. So yeah, just a Got caution it. or. One interesting thing on that, though, I noticed is completions remain at a very high level. So starts are you yep. know, saying I'm starting actually putting a foundation in the ground. Completion is what's already in the pipeline, you know, to, going towards uh, uh, getting across the finish line, which has been at a number of homes in the pipeline going to completion has been at a record level. Maybe it came down a little bit last month. I didn't check. But that means that completions, which actually I think is what matters for output GDP jobs, the economy that actually was pretty good in July. Yeah, actually, saying, rose. Yeah, it rose in July. Yeah, yeah. which there's is definitely a shift or towards away from single family towards more multifamily. Yeah, which you would which expect given yeah prices and rents. But given our conversation last week with John Burns, you know, yeah. uh, the multifamily side. Okay, uh, very good. Um, anything else you want to bring up before we move on? So, okay. uh, no, I think I think uh, everyone is okay. waiting with uh, bated breath here. So. Okay, yeah, bated breath. The mystery guest. Uh, is Ellen Hughes Cromwick. 
Ellen, uh, it's good to have you uh, on Inside Economics. Thanks for joining us. And where are you speaking to us? From? Are you in D.C.? Are you in D.C.? And I I am right now in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Ah. And uh, enjoying a beautiful day here, looking outside, but staying in at my laptop. Sorry about that. I, I, you know, but uh, you've got a fan base out there, and you've got to speak to them. So it's very good to have you. And Ellen, you've got you have a storied career. Now you're at Third Way. Third Way is this wonderful. Is it fair to call it a think tank? Kind of thir Third yep, Way, meaning kind of down the middle of the road. Centrist, centrist think tank, and I'm working in the climate and energy program, and we're really all about uh, doing analysis and understanding what the uh, likely pathway is to net zero emissions by 2050. So. We have many different experts across a variety of technologies and lots of work uh, to do in this area. Yeah, Third Way is a great think tank. Uh, I'm trying to think of the economists there that I've worked with in the past. Uh, Jim, uh, shoot. Jim, Jim Kessler. Oh, Jim Kessler, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's one of our leaders, absolutely outstanding. Yeah. And we have Zach Moeller and Gabe Horwitz in the economic program. Uh, they they do just an incredible amount of work understanding these different policies and looking at what the opportunities can be for the future. Yeah, he's a great guy, great and a great think tank. Uh, and but Ellen, you you've you had a long career before you found your way to Third Way. Do you want to just give us a sense of you know your journey, how you got to where you are today? Yeah, well, you know. As I think it's true for so many economists. We, we are, I think, in a profession that offers up a lot of different career pathways. And I, am cer I certainly fit that mold. Having started after graduate school at the Council of Economic Advisors and then teaching, I went into banking for a little bit, and in the course of that, I have just have enjoyed a, a great career journey with my husband, who's a health economist. Well, I think I knew uh, before you. Didn't I get to meet Paul? Yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, yeah. I got to know Paul before I, I got to meet It was close. I'm not sure. Yeah. I can't yeah. So, so the magic number, we had three uh, adult children now, and just, you know, love family, love athletics, and had been fortunate to, you know, work at Ford Motor Company for many years, which it, you know, I think that both of you are going to understand this so well that when you work in a cyclical industry, uh, it's like drinking from a fire hose in terms <laughs> of macro and all of the different elements of a, you know, a, a supply chain that the auto industry represents. So it's a, it's a little bit of hedging. Uh, you know, looking at commodities and marketing and sales and production programming and strategic planning, uh, a little, a little bit, and sometimes a lot of of it, and uh, just incredible experience. So, so you were chief. How long you were chief economist for Ford? From when to when? Yeah, from two thousand four to 2014. So during the financial crisis. So that yes. must have been a pretty cool time to be. That was exciting. Yeah. Very, very stressful, but, but exciting. Yeah. So, so would, would urge anybody listening out there for all our listeners today to really think seriously about getting into economics and business economics. It's just an incredibly satisfying, rewarding career. See, Ellen, of course, you see, she's a salesperson, always selling. Did you notice that? I like it. I'm convinced. Profession. I'm convinced. Yeah. <laughs> she's actually really good at it. I like, I, oh yeah, I want to do that too. Yeah. Well, Mark, you are, Mark, you're, you're a star. Come on. You, oh, come on. you can definitely uh, sell better than I can. And I think all the, all the different dimensions of your career are something that, you know, we, we think of as a role model. You oh, know, stop, you, stop. Oh, Chris, seriously. For sure. Oh, come on. Yeah. yeah. Okay, no, you can come I back don't. on this podcast anytime you want, Ellen. Anytime. <laughs> anytime. Hey, I did want to ask you one thing about the uh, given your, and I might be pushing you in a place you don't want to go. So you can say, hey, Mark, stop. But on this the conversation we just had a minute ago on vehicle sales, where I think we're at 13, 13 and a half million annualized rate, which 
for context, before the pandemic, we we're at 17 million. So we're like well south of that. Does that does it feel like to you that we're at so low because of demand? People are can't don't want to buy, or is it supply? They just can't find the cars that they want to buy. Do you have a sense of that? I'm just curious. I, I'm out of the business of doing um, macro analytics for autos, but yeah. I will say 13 is is low. So absolutely, there's a supply constraint. You know, okay. just looking around here in Southeast Michigan, yeah. you know, a bit ago we saw a lot of of you know, obviously in 2020 excess supply, but then you know, with the chip shortage and parts problems, there's no question that we've got tight inventory here so it's going to be a while for that recovery but it, it'll come back because we know you know discretionary scrappage in the business is north of 11 and and so you know we've got at least room to run here i think to uh, see from that. i did not know that is that right is well, let let me let me uh, make sure i'm clear on that yeah. on that point you know when you disaggregate like alan greenspan used to do between discretionary and physical scrappage yeah you know, there's a certain weibel distribution uh failure rate to vehicles and so if they're you know running around uh 11 years old they're getting to a point where they have to be you know mm -hmm. have to be replaced but then you have that other piece which is hey i want an electric vehicle Mm -hmm. So the vehicle that you're putting in the used market in the funnel, you know, might have some life left to it, but you're moving on to a new, a new, uh, a new vehicle. So I, you know, it, some of that dynamic could be changing now uh, in light of some of these, um, you know, shifts in the technology. Yeah. What, to that end, uh, our, we have an economist, a good uh, vehicle um uh, a fellow who focused on the vehicle and Mike Brisson, who's been on the podcast before. And he points out that, you know, that we're just, we, since the pandemic hit, we've all driven a lot less, right? So maybe there isn't as much kind of depreciation of the stock uh, that typically, but still that doesn't explain 17 versus yeah. 13. Yeah, no, absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. And then what about, you know, when you look at public transit drops and the fact that people aren't commuting Good point. Offices, does that offer up additional yeah. incremental demand? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, a lot of a lot of dynamics there, but 13 sounds, yeah, it does sound low. Oh. And then you were at the chamber, you were the chief economist at the chamber of, no, excuse me, at the Department of Commerce. I keep saying chamber, yes, Department right. of Commerce. And that was under President Obama. That must have been pretty cool as well. Yeah, that was exciting. We really accomplished a lot in that um, last period of his uh, administration, a, a lot of work on digital flows, data flows uh, between countries, obviously a lot of work on trade agreements that we did not get across the finish line, but are still extremely important, especially uh, with Asia and Europe. I think as you look ahead to the future and the kind of trading partners, friends that we'll be um, expanding our relationships with. So that was a lot of groundwork that, that we did in that period. Yeah, I guess the one disappointment, I, and maybe it wasn't, but from my perspective, the disappointment of that time was the Trans-Pacific Partnership, right? That was the trade deal, free trade deal with the uh, Pacific Rim nations, excluding China until China played by the rules, which they weren't, you know, everyone knew that they weren't doing. But that fell apart, unfortunately. So I, I'm sure you must have played a pretty active role in that. Uh, Secretary Pritzker, you know, she put her running shoes on. She was all yeah. over the place working diligently to get that across the finish line. You know, that was a disappointment. But again, you know, we have the fundamentals in place to really activate that aggressively. So I think I think it's something that future you know, this um, administration or future administrations are going to get back to. Makes perfect sense, right? I mean, I never really understood that because, you know, it's a way to push back on China and say, hey, you want to be part of this free trade pact, you got to play by the rules. So it just confused me to know. When, and you look at the economic impacts on the U.S., they were pretty inconsequential. I didn't think, you know, even not from a micro perspective, I didn't think it was going to be that big a deal. But anyway, that's a shame. 
Uh, and then you've, now you're at Third Way, and Third Way is doing a lot on climate. Uh, you, in our conversations prior to the, uh, the podcast, you were uh, talking about some work you're doing uh, with BCG, I think you, you mentioned. Uh, did you want to talk about that a little bit, the, that kind of work you're doing? Well, I, we're, we're going to be releasing uh, a lot of the uh, report outs from this study that we commissioned uh, with the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, and we joined with Breakthrough Energy to lead this effort. And uh, we basically um, examined six clean energy technologies and the supply chains for each of those. So this is really pathbreaking because we really haven't seen studies of this uh, scope that really drilled down and each of the supply chain segments for these technologies and then you know, measuring market size, looking at export market opportunities, and then measuring competitiveness of U.S. companies. And that, I think, is going to offer up a lot of, um, you know, good insights for the public. This will all be in the public domain. We'll be releasing it hopefully soon. And I think um, it's a good springboard for understanding how provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act in the bipartisan infrastructure law in other, you know, legislation. Look at the Chips and Science Act. Yeah. The, mm -hmm. You know, just to name a few, there are many ways that we're really accelerating now these clean energy technologies. And I, I, I think the U.S. is going to be a, a marked leader in many of these. Oh, that's encouraging. Yeah, you're, it's just amazing what uh, has gotten across the legislative finish line here in the last uh, last year. I mean, yeah, I mean, back, back at you on that. Were you surprised at these um, legislative uh, efforts and the fact that we've had a now a Congress that has really been able to march forward on climate uh, change and other issues? Totally. I, I mean, and it's also kind of snuck up on us, right? I mean, because it, it, you know, it wasn't just one big massive piece of legislation. It was a bunch of pretty big pieces of legislation that when you bring them all together, you go, oh, wow, this is pretty impressive. The Inflation Reduction Act, which we're going to go into in a minute here. You mentioned the CHIPS Act. That's that's pretty cool. You know, that's going to go back to the auto industry and vehicle industry and secure our chip supplies, which goodness knows we need uh, going back to China. And and then you mentioned the bipartisan infrastructure bill. That was a I guess that was back at the end of last year, almost a year ago now. You add all that up, uh, I think the total amount of funding into the economy is something like um, $1.5 trillion. So this is a pretty significant. And then a lot of that goes to the topic at hand, and that is climate risk mitigation, right? I mean, a significant amount of that. They, and they all help each other. They all kind of work together uh, to do that. Yeah, it's really fascinating to see, you know, in the standard macro textbook, there's always the chapter about the fact that fiscal policy lags, it tends to be reactive, it ends up not having the kind of positive spillover effects that, you know, would be intended by lawmakers. Um, now we're seeing, I think, more astute policymaking that we're getting to a point where we've got the evidence base. I mean, remember a few years ago, the Evidence Act passed, which said, hey, you know, legislative uh, leaders here, we have to measure the outcomes and make sure that we're implementing policies with a strong evidence base. And I think that is really now starting to um, infiltrate the way that lawmakers are putting these uh, these uh, packages together. So that's a, I think, you know, maybe, maybe we're seeing a new dynamic here in terms of more proactive policy. Well, now don't get ahead of yourself. Uh, you know, I <laughs> uh, get a little giddy there, I'd have to say, but uh, good, good reason to feel good about things. I mean, a lot of progress uh, has been, uh, has been made here. Um, well, let's dive into the Inflation Reduction Act and, you know, the uh, IRA, we've, We've talked about that on the podcast. We've written about it. We did a, a macroeconomic impact analysis that we produced you know, back a few weeks ago. But uh, for this conversation, 
I, I think we'd like to focus on the climate risk provisions, which at the end of the day, I think in my view, and I'm sure yours, that th that is the most impactful part of the IRA. This, this is going to have an impact long into the future, not just you know this year, next year, and the year, or the year after, and it's a big deal. So uh, uh, with that as a, a bit of context, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how we want to dive into it because there's so many moving parts here. Maybe, maybe the way to ask it is, of all the different things climate related in the IRA Inflation Reduction Act, what do you think you find, what, what, which is the most impactful? What do you think is the, the biggest deal in terms of affecting the, the climate emissions uh, and the economy going forward? You're absolutely right. There is just a plethora of provisions in IRA uh, adding up to about 370 billion over a 10 year period. Let me just cherry pick what I think might be the top five. And uh -oh. again, apolo apologies. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> hey, apologies. Chris, write these down, Chris. Um, write these down. Write these down. Okay, because we have to come back. Out. Go ahead. All right, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, apologies to our listeners who have their favorite provision in here because there's just absolutely so, so much that's beneficial. And just as, guess, a, as a coda, I might interrupt you along the way just to break it up and just to get our minds around it, because there's a lot of things and they're all hard to get your mind around unless you think about this on a daily basis. So yeah, uh, yeah. I, might, I might interrupt. I'm not being rude. I'm just, well, I am being rude, but you know. No, that's fine. That's fine. And, and again, truth and advertising, you know, I focus more on the electric vehicle and yeah, battery provisions. Right. I am by no means an expert, expert on offshore wind, for example. Uh, but but the, I guess the top five, you know, I don't want to discount the fact that there's a lot of EJ40 provisions in here. Um, they look like small dollar signs, but these are provisions that really try to build out the equity of advancing toward a clean energy economy, whether they're grants in communities or they're some kind of credit to take advantage of installing solar panels or buying energy efficient appliances or heat pumps. I mean, all of those measures doesn't, um, you know, rise to, you know, dollar billions mm -hmm. in terms of a, an EV tax credit, but they will make a huge difference in a lot of disadvantaged communities. I mean, think about communities that are on the route to the Inland Empire in California. And now all of a sudden you have some tax credits for heavy duty vehicles to clean them up. I mean, that's gonna make a big difference in people's lives. And I think, you know, that is one of my top five. So I'll, I'll just throw that out there. There are many different provisions in IRA that have these equity considerations. Oh, so, um, so you're kind of, there's a, there's a lot of small kind of line items that, when you add it all up, really has a meaningful impact, particularly on communities that lower income, uh, disadvantaged communities that are under particular stress due to climate change. Yes, exactly. Got it. Got it. Yep. Got it. Climate change, but also, you know, expenditures for uh, lower energy efficient appliances or uh, their electricity um, spending. So they're really trying to, you know, help these uh, households that are, are in disadvantaged communities that, you know, they, they have outdated appliances or um, their electric grid is expensive for different reasons. And, you know, I like that intention in the legislation that they focused on that. It's interesting. We, uh, <clears throat> Moody's, were doing a lot of work in the climate area and uh, we uh, calculate these, as you can imagine, scores. I mean, the rating agency, score, we score everything. We create these scores for physical risk, phys physical climate risk, uh, mostly acute, but also chronic, you know, heat and that kind of thing, uh, flooding and fires and anything related to climate. And we do this for uh, parcels. So I, you, if you give me your address, we could tell you what your score is for climate risk. And uh, if you uh, do a scatter plot uh, of uh, on the across, let's say, metropolitan areas or counties or pick a level of geography, on the x-axis, 
is the score, the score, the higher the score, the more risk you are, the lower the uh, score, the lower risk, and compare that to the income level of that geography, it's, it's amazing. You can, it's so clear that uh, low income parts of the country are at much greater climate risk than uh, higher income areas. And I, I just, I, I guess that's intuitive, but I was shocked at how strong a relationship that is. Pretty amazing. Exactly, Mark. I'm so glad you're doing that work because measuring this is half the battle, right? I mean, yeah. it's only in the recent, maybe last 10 years that we've been able to get just better data to fully understand and make it transparent. Because, you know, if you don't measure it, you're not going to know about it. And I think getting getting that data out, especially for, you know, insurance, reinsurance, but also to focus policy more directly. Because, you know, in a, in a sense, if if you don't address this equity consideration, you're you're really missing a great opportunity for these individuals, people in these communities to reach their full potential. And that adds to productivity growth. It has dividends for the broader economy over time. So number one, top of the list is this uh, plethora of provisions that go to uh, making sure that uh, we address climate risk from a from an from, through the prism of, of equity. What you know, trying to help communities that are under the most uh, that are lower income under the most stress. That's great. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So so number two. Number Two. Yeah, number yeah. two is yeah. one of my favorites. Uh, it's called the 48C Manufacturing Tax Credit huh. uh, at a 30% rate. And I'm sure you all have looked at this pretty carefully, but it was funded at the $10 billion level. Now, why is this important? Well, it's going to apply to all kinds of uh, manufacturing activities. And the reason I think it's critical is that, you know, we have a lot of factories in, uh, you know, historic uh, communities, especially in the Midwest, that if we can retool those, um, we're going to be off to the races. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically around EVs, although there are many different types of manufacturing uh, facilities that could apply for this. And I think it's going to be a huge help for companies as they look at their capital allocation and figure out, you know, how do I get this done? Because you have to, as you know, um, spend a fair amount to retool a facility that that 30% um, credit is going to be extremely valuable. Now, 10 billion isn't going to go a long way. I can't give you an exact estimate if you were retooling you know, Wayne Assembly Plant on Michigan Avenue, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how much is that going to cost if we want to make that entirely an EV plant, all, all battery electric vehicle plant? Uh, but, you know, could come in at around a billion or so. Uh, that um, 48C tax credit may be one uh, piece of how you put together a plan for retooling. This may be way deep in the weeds, but how does that tax credit get allocated? Do you know? I mean, is it uh, first come first serve kind of thing? Or do you know how that works? Um, you know, I don't believe that they yeah. have issued the uh, guidelines for that yet. We're just I now see. getting some guidelines. Like this morning, yeah. we just got some guidelines from uh, the Department of Energy and IRS on the EV tax credit. So this will be coming out and we'll get better definition uh, on that, on that over time. Got it. Got it. Um, the third, the third one on my top five are the EV tax credits. Yeah. I think the um, most important aspect of this EV tax credit is that they did retain the seven thousand five hundred level of that credit, mm -hmm. which is critical. You know that we get that we have something that's close to the cost spread between an ICE and an EV. Now it's- ICE being internal combustion engine for those- Yes, are, yeah. and it, yes, and an EV. Now, you know, that's shifting, obviously, as we see battery costs coming down, especially for um, a, a, an iron phosphate um, battery chemistry. You know, 
it's not perfect, but I think that's probably the right amount of a, of a credit. And, you know, it will provide a significant boost on the demand side to get us hopefully close to that 50% target of EVs in the US by 2030. Um, there are some provisions in there that uh, do, re do require uh, sourcing for battery components mm -hmm. on the components think about a, on a, on a, a cathode and anode an electrolyte separator. Those are the big four battery components and also some requirements on the battery critical minerals and the sourcing of that. So there are some uh, very onerous requirements that come into play after 2024 for some and after 2023 for others. Let me ask so, you on that one, because that's that's where I've seen some criticism of the legislation that you have these very severe constraints in terms yes. of eligibility to get the tax credit. And sourcing is a big part of that. I mean, you got to get the, the materials that go into building these batteries and here, not somewhere else. And that's an impediment because a lot of these minerals are in China, they're in different parts of Africa, Latin America, other parts of the world. If you were a king for the day, would you have done that? Would you have put in those sourcing requirements or, or do you think th that that is really a, a problem here in terms of uh, this? Yeah, and I, I, I know I was waxing eloquently about fiscal policy. Yeah. <laughs> Little more proactive, but you know, in some sense, this is a very strategic component of the credit. For example, um, the provision around foreign entity of concern for battery components starts after the end of 2023. Mm -hmm. In other words, prior to December 31st, 2023. Um, that provision is is not active. Okay. So it does provide a bit of a runway for companies to start looking ahead. And of course, as you know, um, Mark, really well, when you put together a sourcing plan, you're looking out at least three to five years for any product program. Sure. So will they have some flexibility as they get into year two, three, four, and five? Yes, I think companies will start to respond to this and we'll see investments in the U.S. for the production of battery components. So, you know, it does provide that incentive. Hey, let's get that um, sourcing, you know, more diversified. It's been centered in uh, certain countries and, you know, we really need to have a better supply chain. You know, the, the saying about, um, hey, let's not... Uh, you know, kind of have a crisis that we can't find an opportunity in. Well, in some sense, COVID and the supply chain battle bottlenecks gave us a bit of a wake up call about supply chains and how vulnerable they are. And, and so I think that legislation is gonna, is gonna be beneficial. It's gonna give a nudge to uh, redirecting sourcing and, and really stand up a battery cell industry in the U.S. and our um, allied countries. So it sounds like if you were king, you would have done it roughly the same way. Uh, hey, Chris, if you're king, would you have done it the same way? Would, or would you have, uh, and I, I guess you're saying because you are king, you're going to show some flexibility here. December 31, 2023 comes around. Maybe we'll, we'll stretch this a little bit to make it work, is what you're saying. Chris, do you have a different take on that? I mean, do you have any, uh, any views on that? Well, if I'm king, then... No. You're king. I'm a free trade I, but, you know, advocate, I, I, right? I can take that right away from you, but you're king at the moment. Go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I wouldn't put that restriction in, right? Clearly, you would not have put that restriction in. No. Uh, oh, interesting. If we're okay. not the lowest cost producer, why force it? Now, you could, you could argue um, certain countries, certain areas, right? Some preferential treatment. Um, but just to blanketly force, try to force an industry in the U.S., I, 
I don't know how effective that's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess then, you know, on the, critical, on the critical minerals, the uh, foreign entity of concern doesn't kick in until after December 31st, 2024, by the oh, way. Okay. So there's okay. a little bit of a different um, runway for the critical minerals. Again, recognizing, you know, we do not have sufficient mining for lithium here in the U.S., yeah. uh, which is, you know, as you know, a very critical component for the cells. And yes, this does provide uh, a little bit of a stick. The carrot is the 7,500. The stick are these restrictions. Yeah. Yeah, well, it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out, uh, you know, uh, because it is uh, uh, a little bit different than what a kind of a traditional economist would do. Uh, but of course, that's kind of a silly statement in the context of legislation, because you've got all these political constraints as well. And I'm yeah. sure that played a role in their decisioning around all of this. Yeah. yeah. Um, Chris, if, if we could implement a carbon tax and some, you know, yeah. Energy standards that may, you know, that really kind of set the stage for that. You know, obviously, as an economist, that uh, does does make sense. But but we we just aren't in that world, and so, and so, so that's that's why I think you know strategically a little bit of a carrot and stick in the way that they structured this credit probably makes some sense. You should know, Ellen, that Chris is this one of these, uh, you know, out in the out in the out in the universe, out in the universe, the optimist. You know, I, I have to keep <laughs> reining him in. You know, not very practical, this Doridi fella. Yeah, uh, just the opposite. Um, okay, so that's three. Number four. Yes, number four has to do with, and I'm sure you have looked at this, which is the loan programs office at the Department of Energy. Right. And the loan program office has over $40 billion available for loans and loan guarantee um, authority. They have three programs in there and the IRA increases the loan authority for these programs and it appropriates some additional funds in the program to run it, uh, especially the credit subsidy cost. And it does also establish a new program in LPO, Loan Programs Office at the Department of Energy, which is focused on reusing energy infrastructure. Um, so I think, you know, I think that's going to have a lot of bang for the buck. Uh, you know, there's a lot of interest and applications uh, coming in there. And um, I look, I look to see that as as being a useful uh, way of um, looking looking at investment and capital coming in for these projects. Yeah, uh, that I think that does have a lot of potential juice, you know, particularly for, for, to provide the financing necessary to do a lot of this uh, investment and development. I think that's going to be really critical here. So, very and, important. Uh, recall, you know, Tesla did receive a loan uh, from did they? in 2009. Uh, Ford mm -hmm. Motor Company also received a loan, but you know that was the beginning of Tesla's rise was mm -hmm. uh, getting some low cost funding through this LPO program. I didn't know that, that's interesting. Oh, great. So that's number four, <clears throat> we're down to number five. Yes, number five. Uh, I think it has to do with kind of, again, this is more strategic. This is long run. This is uh, patient capital, which is uh, some funding for nuclear fuel sourcing and a nuclear tax credit. Again, we have a lot of innovation happening in this field. You may have heard about small modular reactors uh, again, this is an area that uh, Third Way has a lot of expertise in. It's not my field, but what I understand from their research is that these small modular reactors can be manufactured at a facility and then installed on site. Think of, you know, a, maybe a steel plant that has uh, associated with it uh, 
carbon-free fuel coming out of a nuclear facility, a small modular reactor, or other types of manufacturing companies that co-locates such a small modular reactor. So I think this funding is going to be really important to start that effort and to get that rolling out. Of course, you know, these are long-lived assets that require substantial effort to get to a point where uh, the installation and operation is taking place. But it seems to be, you know, the kind of optionality we need if we're on some uh curve to get to net zero emissions by 2050. We have to be thinking long run and to have options to trigger different types of technology, you know, and lots of technologies we don't even know about yet, but we should have that optionality to, to help fund that. Yeah. So did, uh, I, I do want to ask you what you absolutely did not like. I know you, this, this almost feels I know you've been so active in helping uh, put this le legislation together, particularly on the EV side. It feels a little bit like your baby, but I'm going to press you in a second about what you didn't like about the legislation. But just I want to provide a little bit of context and, and see your reaction. And I don't know if you've done work in trying to take all of these provisions yeah. and translating it into emissions and then macroeconomic impacts. And we've done a little bit of work there. And just to give you a sense of it, if uh, currently, there's roughly a 4.5 billion metric tons of, uh, of uh, emissions, uh, CO2 emissions in, uh, in the US, 4.5 billion. If there's no, if there had been no policy action, there was no IRA and nothing else, then by 2100, uh, we'd still see a reduction in emissions because of rising cost of carbon and we were assuming some uh, improvements in technology, we'd be at roughly 3 billion metric tons, which by the way, would be a disaster because temperature rise at that point would be quite significant and the damage to our economy, very serious. But with the IRA, we're calculating that emissions by 2100 will be somewhere around 2.4, 2.5 billion metric tons. So that's that, you know, when you think about it, you go, oh, well, that's still far from net zero. We got a long way to go. But conversely, you think about that, given this upfront investment we're making today, $380 billion over 10 years, and we're getting that kind of lift, that's a big deal. And if you translate that reduction in carbon emissions to what it means for physical risk, economic loss due to hurricanes and flooding and economic loss due to chronic physical risk like sea level rise or heat stress, GDP, we found, is... Uh, 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 higher by 2.7% in 2100, 2.7% higher in 2100. So that's, that, that's, that's a big deal in my mind. That's meaningful. Um, does, have you done any of that kind of work or did you, have you gone down that path trying to connect those dots back to the macro economy or is that is something you, or what do you think of that? What's your reaction to that? Yeah, I guess I'll react to it. That, that is out of scope right now for, for what I'm working on. Sounds but, like something um, we collaborate on to me. I, I would, you know, I would love to because I think the economic implications of this are critical. I was talking with an economist at um, CEA recently, and, you know, one of the things that they're pointing out is that the longer you wait, the higher the cost yeah. and therefore the lower the GDP. So in other words, you're going to have a, a, a more adverse impact on GDP the longer you delay these actions. These are not you know, um, cost-free decisions that uh, Congress is making, that we as Americans are making today. And um, you know, to the extent that we can measure that and quantify that, I think then we'll get more resonance. We'll understand that these investments that you make today have more impact more bang for the buck than if you just simply wait and and you know delay action the fact that you know there's potential for bipartisan action going forward beyond ira speaks to that particular observation that yeah, you know yeah. these how many how many uh, states 
Mark, uh, that you see that are impacted now by the climate challenge. Uh, you know, pick pick your favorite state and look at the situation. And so <laughs> that's a that's a you know that's something that's bringing the reality forward. I think yeah. to people, and I think for us for the economics profession, I really hope that you know we really make this kind of analysis more mainstream in our um, assessments and try to lengthen out beyond the next couple of years what we see in terms of how these risks materialize. Um, it, it, it really is a it's a it's a solid case for building scenarios and I do uh, really appreciate that you and your team have taken this on. Yeah, I mean, that that's so key because uh, going back to fiscal policy, it's always been judged, or at least in recent decades, by the 10-year budget horizon. You know, what does it mean? for the, So when I say $380 billion, that's over the 10-year budget horizon. That's what the mindset is. That's what the Congressional Budget Office, the kind of the folks that look at this for the budget purposes look at. But for climate risk, and actually for a lot of other policies that matter a lot, like Social Security, just to, take, just to pick one, it's really important to look beyond the 10-year budget horizon because you know if you don't, you're going to make some pretty bad decisions around what should be in, in should be we should be doing and not be doing. Uh, I know we're running out of time. Uh, I do want though to ask, you know, of all of the provisions in the, the legislation, what is at the bottom of the list that you didn't like? What would you have done differently? Well, I guess I'll come back to the EV tax credit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I heard Chris loud and clear. My um, issue is with the uh, price caps for these vehicles. And I know this has been unpop, you know, unpopular that we don't want to give money to high income individuals. But my experience in the auto sector is that when initial new products uh, hit job one, that is, they're now going to be coming down the assembly line, that, you know, often those initial runs of a brand new vehicle, unfortunately, have to be higher priced because you're running low volume. So you're at the top of the average cost curve Good Point. in that period. You're at the top of the demand curve. And it's just simply because, hey, if you've got a factory with a lot of capital in it, and you're only making 20,000 units when the capacity for the, the uh, facility is 200,000 units, you know, it's just gonna be costly. It's gonna be more costly than when you get to peak volume for the facility, which for autos tends to be around 200,000 plus. Although Tesla has been innovating, I don't know if you've seen this recently, but the Fremont, California plant could be reaching as much as 500,000 yeah. capacity. So <laughs> you're, you're working down the average cost curve and getting to the bottom of that curve uh, you know, pretty quickly now that they're on third, fourth generation product. But when you're just starting out and you got all these companies that are just starting their product releases on EVs and they're low volume, it's just going to be higher cost. So that's just the way it is. And providing an incentive, regardless of what the price is for those initial runs, I would just say, you know, suck it up. You know, it's not perfect, but that would get the demand stimulus because for a a company where you're making capital investments that have long lives and it takes you three years from the start before you even see a product coming off the assembly line, three or four years. You know, you've got, you've got to just, you know, give them that expectation that demand is going to be there. So that, I guess that's my spiel on the price caps for well, it's 80,000 max for vehicles, uh, cars and vans, and then um, uh, 80,000, I'm sorry, for SUVs and pickups and 55K for, for cars. Well, uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I like the suck it up. It's spoken like a mom with three kids. Suck it up, yeah. you know? There you <laughs> go. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, three highly successful kids. Uh, 
Uh, well, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, that happened pretty fast, I'd have to say. And we didn't get to the game, Ellen. You got off the hook because we play this statistics game, but we're not going to do it this week. But we're definitely going to have you, if you're up for it, you know, yeah. you're going to come back and uh, Chris is going to show you. Well, at that time, we'll have Ryan. You don't, Ryan wasn't able to make it, as we pointed out, but he's really, really good at the data. So we'll have you back and play the game if that's okay. That sounds great. Good. Well, thanks so much. Thank and, you so much. Yes, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Oh, yeah, this is great. And learned a lot and uh, appreciate uh, the Same time here. that you took with us. Uh, and with that, um, dear listener, we're going to call this a podcast and talk to you next week.